Hi everyone, welcome to the QA Ops channel. I'm Rafael Lima. In this video, is going to, I'm going to be closing down the rest of shoe series. For now, uh, we can definitely talk about uh, about it more in the future. But for now, I'm going to be closing down. There is there are a lot of stuff that is, we can still do related to rest of shoe and how we can evolve, and I'll be talking about later on in the video. But there, I, I would like to cover other other aspects of automation, right? We I would still would like to talk about Selenium, but not for now. I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into the infrastructure level, like how can we automate, uh, how can we create tooling, how, uh, talk about DevOps, uh, culture and, and Docker and so on. So it's a little bit different than what I've been covering. So in this video right now, I'm going to be talking about removing some aspects of the rest assure that we used. Uh, to see how that code would look like without rest assured, right? We can definitely achieve a lot of the same stuff that we did with, that we did with rest assure without rest assure. So I have here uh, our code. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create an alternative test, right? So we have a user test and I'm going to create a new, a different set of tests. Right, so I'm going to create a user alternative user test. All right, I duplicated the code. Uh, so let me just make sure my pointer is highlighted. Now I have a highlighter on my pointer. Um, so yeah, so we have a alternative test, right? So just Let's just make sure everything is working as we already used to. All right, I'm also on my uh, English master branch. And the first thing that I'm going to do, I would like to remove the base test because I'm going to be changing some of that stuff there. So for us that, that have been covering up that have been for you that have been keeping up with the videos we have a bunch of stuff here in, in related to the setup of our test i'm going to remove this extension here right where we're using uh, hierarchy and i'm going to remove this and of course uh, just by remove this my test is going to fail uh, because i don't have i don't have the the base test anymore, right? So the first thing that I'm going to do, let me go back here. Let's copy and paste this, right? And I'm going to remove all of this so we can construct all of this together, right? Um, let's, re let's leave it there, otherwise it's going to fail for compilation error, right? We, we, we it's failing everything and now we're going to make it pass one by one right? i'm going to remove this because this is what i wanted to show you i don't want to have any of this i i am going to leave this here because this is the one if you don't remember this is the one that helps us to debug better or, or not debug better to actually see the headers of the of the request whenever we are logging it, right? So whenever it fails, we can see the actual request there and the response. So it makes more, it makes it easier for us to figure out what will happen. So, all right, this is still failing, right? As you can see, this is, a, this is still failing. We have a bunch of failing tests here. So the first thing that I need to, and it's failing because it's connection refused, right? I removed, the base test uh, setup of these two URL. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this URL here on the top. And then I'm going to say private static final. And this is going to be my string and I'm going to call a base URL. Just remembering that a static final is, static is, is, a, is a class variable, not an instance variable and final is because it's going to be final nobody can change that after after programmatic program pro, through code <laughs> nobody can change that through code right so i'm going to copy this 
right? And the second one is a uh, base path, which our is slash API. Cool, awesome. So now we have to tell our tests that we are using those, right? Uh, we are still, right? Remember that what Hersher sure did was you would get the base path in the base URL in the base path, define within Hersher, and we we'll mag would magically use here. We don't have it. We don't have it here anymore, right? So we need to actually change these now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change to string URI. Right. And then I'm going to say this is going to be the base URL plus the base path. Right. Plus the endpoint that we are going to test, which in this case is list user endpoint. Right. And I'm going to change this to URI and I'm going to put a semicolon here. Right. So this test. Hopefully it's going to pass, and it did, right? So, but then we still have four tests to go. I don't want to be replicating these all the time, right? It's it's okay if we change here. It's going to be changed throughout it, throughout everything. But then I might want to log the construct, uh, uh, the 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 actual building of the URI. I can put on my log to make sure. Uh, on my log, I can actually see that it built it correctly if there are any issues. So it would be better to have these uh, on a specific method. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy these and I'm going to refactor. I'm going to go to extract method and I'm going to say get URI. It's going to be a private and awesome. I'm also going to put this on the very bottom. Awesome. Right? But then the endpoint here is a it's hard coded, right? I don't want this endpoint here, so I'm going to say string endpoint and I change this to endpoint. And it's there. I could if I wanted to log, I could put a log in here and say this is the endpoint uh, and I could actually construct this and see it being constructed. So now I I would like to get the URI and I can put here that is for the list user endpoint. Right? Awesome. I could also put this here but i don't like it right this is it's not not only that i don't like it but this is not the java way right if we were doing ruby or if we were doing python then it would definitely be okay but on java it's not right, so let me put an extra enter here great so now what i need to do i need to uh replicate all of these, right? There is one thing that we did also here in the base test that we are not doing. Remember that we are setting the content type to JSON, right? It needs that to make sure that it's uh, it's constructing a JSON upon request. So let's say that uh, we're going to change this one, right? This one, let's see it fail. It's still failing because we haven't changed the URI. I'm going to put here and I'm going to change the URI to this one. And I'm going to change this to URI. And when I do this, it's going to fail because uh, we are not using JSON. This content type right here, content type text plain. So I need to tell that I need to set content type to JSON that we were doing the base test. So now on my given, as we saw in the first, uh, in one of the first or second class, uh, lessons uh, video, uh, I can put a given, I can say content type is content type.json. 
I can awesome right I, I only need to do these on on uh, when I do a post and I put because he uses the body right the the rest of them uses the URL string so we, we, we don't have to do anything else there uh, so what else we do have here so we have now to put this here and what is the is list users and this is become URI right uh, this is doing a get so I don't need to do anything else this one is also doing so so this is using a get also um, so let let make sure we run this just to make sure it's passing it's failing because we are calling this method here and we need to also make sure that this method has a a the URI so I'll put it here, this becomes URI. I can rerun the test. Now it's going to work. Awesome. Cool. And then I can put this show user and then I can change this to URI. I can now check. Awesome. I can now run all my tests within the the alternative user test and all of them are working that's that's amazing so one of the things that we are still not checking right remember that when we we learn about uh response spec we made sure that the response on every call would be a json as well so now i don't have this right it's not checking this i need to put it here right i need to put here somewhere so what I'm going to do is on my expectation. So I do expect the content type to be content type JSON. And I can copy here. And now I can put right here. Right here. right here as well and I'm going to put it right here too make sure everything is there so if I run everything control R to run everything that I already requested and everything is there right so if we we compare the alternative user test with user test right we definitely see that it's cleaner right I do have some hidden stuff there that I see some value in, in, in making it implicit. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the world. You can definitely see that I, I was able to code it pretty fast and uh, not, not very hard, right? And then uh, the only thing that I basically did was define this here and then created a, a get URI so uh, everyone can use it. And then I could uh, just adapt the test in order to, to use now these variables here, right? So rest assured helps you a lot, right? But then uh, what, it, what rest assured actually gives you a lot of power is the actual test the actual given when and then structure the readability uh how how, it, how clean it is and how it reads right because the rest it's it's nice it's a nice to have but it's definitely not why we are using rest assured uh so let's make sure we have a commit uh git yeah git add git add dot git status git commit dash m and now i can say create alternative user test without rest assure setup and expect without rest assure setup functionality features features better features awesome uh cool 
So that's mainly what I wanted to show you related to to coding today, uh, and you could see the difference between those two. But then, what what is next, right? What you can do next? I'm definitely going to put all the videos that we have talked about it, the the playlist. But what is next from from you that have been watching these and what you can do next in order to keep improving, right? And and that's mainly my goal here is to make sure you are able to evolve by yourself. I don't want to be, I don't want you to develop some sort of uh, dependencies that dependency that you need that you need me or somebody else to keep showing what needs to be done and what needs to improve. I actually want you to be able to practice enough, practice this enough so that you are able to uh, to evolve by yourself, to learn whatever you need to do to get your job done. All right, so I'm going to go over some aspects here, right? What are our next steps, right? So the first thing is use on your daily basis. You need to make sure you are using whatever you're learning on your daily, on your daily basis. It doesn't matter if it's testing heuristics, if it's testing uh, patterns, uh, techniques. If you don't do, if you don't use your da daily basis, it's going to be hard for you to actually sink in all that knowledge. That's the same with coding, right? You need to be able to, you need to uh, do it so often that you don't actually need to think, almost think of it, or of course you need to think and process everything. But in the beginning stage, you need to do a lot of consulting in books on in Google or in uh, tutorials. But uh, you need to do that on your daily basis. So it's going to be more easier, uh, uh, more and more and more. And that's on everything that you do, right? Even if you are, if we think about uh, driving a car, right? When you are driving a car, you have a mirror, you have three mirrors, you have uh, the wheel you have, uh, if you're driving a manual, whoever drove, have driven a manual, you have three, three pedals and you have the clutch and you have three mirrors and you need to do that all, all at the same time while watching the, ne the car next to you in front of you and people crossing in, in street signs and that kind of stuff, right? And you need to do that automatically. Uh, in the beginning, it's really hard, but at some point you are doing, you are doing in a way that you're not even thinking about it, what you're doing anymore, right? Uh, some people even break the law by using a cell phone and they can actually do 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 it. They're breaking the law, but they can actually do it and uh, drive and actually uh, talk on the phone and, and use the cell phone. So that's on, that's because they practice enough, forget about breaking the law, right? But just about driving, they practice enough that becomes a, a habit and becomes a, a, an automatic uh, ability. So that's the first thing you need to do, regardless of what you're going to learn from now on, right? regardless if it's Python, Java, Selenium API, whatever. Technical aspects of the things that you, you should learn or you should be mindful of, uh, you can do next, right? So you can start working on builders, which are easier or, or more clean way of you creating your, your objects for your testing. Uh, you can create builders uh, by, uh, by scratch, or you can use uh, Lombok uh, to create your own builders uh, to make it easier to create the builders more clean. Uh, properties, you definitely want to start using properties because uh, if your testing is running on your local machine, you're going to use a set of properties. If your test is, is uh, working in a different environment, it's going to be a different set of URL, different set of properties. So you need to make sure that your code is flexible enough so you can say, hey, I'm going to be using on my local. Now I want you to use this URL. Uh, if I'm going to be running this on a CI, then you're going to use other, other URIs, URLs. Uh, Java Faker, the, whenever you need to create uh, random data, like an, somebody's name, somebody's phone number, somebody's identity, whatever, you can use Java Faker in order to, to random create some, some content for you. Watermark, if you have a, 
if you have a dependency, external dependencies or of somebody, some, not necessarily outside your company, but another service within your company that your service depends on, you can use Wiremark to stub your service, right? to stub the external service. So you, don't, you can isolate yourself. You don't have to spin up two service. If you depend on one, you can just use one service. Uh, you're, you're testing your service and you can use your Wiremark to stub the response of that specific service. Uh, should you use BDD with APIs? That's a question you should ask yourself. Uh, in a nutshell, I, BDD is a collaborative uh, communication tool, much more than an automation tool, right? So if, uh, and that means that QAs, designers, uh, UX and uh, product owners, uh, business analysts, whatever you have in your team, they are talking to each other and they are doing uh, they are doing their acceptance criteria and they are building the requirements together. Then definitely you can use uh, BDD with APIs I, I used in the past. But if it's just for your team, this is just uh, the dev team or the QA team or the technical aspect then BDD might help to onboard somebody because it's going to be, uh, uh, it's a live documentation, but it creates an extra layer that you, you start to having to take care of that development of that extra layer, which takes a little bit more time. If you create your code clean enough, uh, then your code is going to be readable. And then it, it's, it's, it's it also, if a person knows how to code, then it's going to be, also easy for her to or for that person to figure out what what we need to do you, you, you we just saw the given when then approach in, in uh, rest show which is fairly easy to understand and read so yeah that's back to you you need to decide that uh, contract testing right so we definitely if you're doing uh, if you have an API that you are testing you need to talk about contract because we we rest assured checks the actual what we did checks the actual functionality of the api right if the api is actually working the contract is mainly the the naming the the naming that you are using right so i could use name the actual word name on my contract but if i got a wrong and i put in portuguese which is nomi I just I just changed it in Portuguese and English, just changing no for an A, so it's name or nome, then your contract's going to break because your code cannot parse another uh, another word or other than name, right? So rest assured you can use JSON schema and rest assured already if you have a JSON schema, you can say hey hit this hit, hit this API and check against this schema and it's just going to check the contract. Or you can use also pack JVM. So that's a different approach that you can take. Uh, on the CD CI strategy, right? So there are a couple of things that we need to consider, uh, especially on depending on your uh, on your environment or, or how how is your uh, how is how is your project and how the team deals with uh, those aspects. So your context, right? That's the word I was looking for. How is your context? Do you have access to the CI? Right? If you have access to the CI, yes, you have access to the CI. Put your test on your CI. Right? Uh, if you have access, you can talk to, if you don't know how to do it, you can definitely talk to someone in your team. It's going to help you say, hey, I, I created some tests and I think it's worth to have on our CI. Uh, just learn how to do it and you're going to be able to you're going to insert your test on the ci which is going to be running on every push right uh, make sure that when you have a ci you want to have a fast feedback right you don't want you don't want your ci to wait uh, a couple hours to finish so make sure uh, you talk to your team to to uh, to insert the correct strategy on your on your pipeline thinking about the test pyramid that depends on your con context at on, on your context as well if you are working on a monolith or, or a legacy code then you you need to be mindful of of your test pyramid and make sure it's not waiting too long to in order to finish everything otherwise 
uh, you don't have short feedback. If you're working on a microservice, then uh, your whole code base can be short enough that you can just put the test that you want and it's going to be because your code, your, it's a microservice, then uh, you're always going to have a fast feedback regardless of the shape of your test pyramid. So uh, yeah, if you have access to the CI, figure out how to put in your CI is going to uh, help a lot the team. If you don't have access to the CI, right? If you don't have access to the CI, do you have access to the dev team? I'm asking all these questions because I, I know that there are some teams, I, I actually know some of the teams that they work uh, separate. So you have access to the dev team. Yes, I have access to the dev team. So talk to them to put your repo on the CI. So say, hey, I have I have this, this re testing repo and I'd like to put on the CI. How, is, is it possible? How can we do that? And see if they if they can help you out with that. So you don't have access to the dev team. Do you have access to listen to the system repo? So basically, the you want to be able to listen to the repo, right? You, you might not have access to you might not have access to to actually put in your CI, but if you have access to listen to the repo, meaning when there is a new push there there is a change any change in the in the code in, in the code repo in the system repo then you can trigger something right so if you don't have access if if you do you have access to that can you can you can you make sure that you are able to listen to that repo right you need to talk to the dev team Oh, another thing that you can do here, you can, you can talk to your manager, you can talk to somebody that can help you get access to that. Uh, create a CI for your team, right? Because with your own team CI, let's say, uh, you can have, and you are listening to the repo, to the coding repo, your CI, your own team CI is going to be listening to the system repo. And whenever there is a change there in the coding repo, it's going to trigger your CI. So you're going to have your, the whole project going to have two CIs in this approach. Right? You were not able to put in the in the dev, let's call it the dev CI. You're not able to put it there. Then try to create your own CI. Right? And you would have another CI just for the functional testing. And then this is not ideal, but it is what it is, right? And then by listening to the, the change in the repository, you your CI would be triggered. So if you don't have access to listen to the repo, create your, your CI for your team, even though you don't have access. Because uh, although you'll not be able to listen to the repo, you're going to have your CI for your team that whenever there is a change on your own code, on, on, on your own functional code, that's going to be triggered, right? And especially if you have, if more than, than one people, one person is actually pushing to the, to the functional testing repo, right? If it's only you, then maybe it's an overkill, but then if you, it's, there are more people pushing, then make sure to have, uh, it makes sense to have your CI there, uh, a CI specific for, for that. So it's going to also integrate, right? It's a, it's a testing code, but it's still a code. It needs to be integrated. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be working, right? So you also could uh, spin up a, if it's only you, you don't have like a, a other, pers other people uh, uh, pushing to that. You can spin up a CI in your local machine with Docker. Uh, you could also uh, use, if you have a Unix or a, a Linux, you can create a local cron job to run the test. So a cron job is a task that you can say, run this every minute or run this on every day at this time, run this uh, twice a day. You can, you can set, you have a lot of parameters that you can set when the task should be triggered. You can do that. 
All right, you can say that. You can also use a watch command, which is a command that you say run the test every n second, and you define by default it's two seconds that's going to run. You can say watch, and then the command that you want to to watch, and by default it's going to rerun that command every uh, two seconds. But you can define whatever the amount of seconds that you want. So there are just a few. Uh, uh, possibilities that you can do uh, in order to put whatever you created in your testing strategy, in your automation testing strategy, right? Of course, you can also after do that, you can you can you can get that uh, if everything passed. Let's say you have a CI and everything passed, then you can choose to deploy it, generating a, 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 a deployable, deploy to a specific environment that you have, and now you can do exploratory testing, you can do whatever you, you need to do extra to make sure your release is good. Okay, thank you for watching. Uh, I am going to be creating a new repo, which is going to be the last for now. So it's going to be uh, git checkout dash b. Eight, and this is alternative test, alternative test, and next steps, and next steps. Just alternative test because the next step was a presentation. Awesome, and then I can do git push origin and my alternative test. So thank you for watching. Uh, I hope to see you in the next videos. We're definitely going to be talking about some interesting things. We're going to be building some interesting things. I'm really excited for the next video that you're going to create. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. If you like the video, give us a thumb, thumbs up. And if you'd like to request anything that I should, that you think I should be covering, uh, please do give me a, a put a comment, give me the feedback and i'll be glad to to talk about that as well right thank you bye